Pablo Genovese. This is his, uh, so one, Pablo, Pablo is what he prefers to be called. Um, this is his first international conference. Um, he's joined us flying up from Argentina. Um, like I said, he works with Altera Software yeah. and is going to be presenting on Scalable API and we're excited to have his uh, international debut here at Los Angeles RubyCon. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for having me, guys. It's, thank you. Uh, that's actually really awesome. Uh, I was just uh, telling you, this place is incredible. Surrounded by cars that I will never sell in my life. I just want to jump right into this car and give the talk from here. I, I can tell you guys, this is amazing. Um, thank you f actually for having me. This is a very good energy here. I can feel it. Uh, last, last Thursday, I gave a workshop it was a really cool one. Yesterday I helped with the uh, Rails Bridge, guys, which it, it was incredible. Uh, I just loved it. And uh, today is kind of you know, the culmination of all of these days that uh, I have been working. You know? So my talk today, uh, actually I was going to present myself a little bit to, so you know who I am. Uh, I have been working for 16 years in the software development industry. I started when I was uh, 17, uh, didn't finish high school, and I was already working. Um, I started actually doing some Visual Fox Pro uh, and then Visual Basic, for those you know who, uh, um, uh, what I'm talking about. And uh, after that, I started working with uh, big companies, uh, big banks in Argentina, uh, processing uh, hundreds of thousands of uh, transactions per minute. Um, and I went from mainframes like S390, uh, programming in COBOL, uh, and RPG later with AS400. Um, and now I kind of, you know, progressed. Uh, so right now I'm, my full-time work is with uh, Ruby. I love Ruby. I fell in love with it in 2006. Uh, pretty much by accident when I got the f my first project uh, to, to work with. It was the year that Rails kind of exploded, so um, I started working with that. Uh, I'm working with Altoros, a uh, very cool company. Actually, they pretty much uh, told me to present something here uh, and paid everything, so that's good. Um, you can follow me on Twitter but, uh, in uh, at El Juancho SF and pretty much my passions are loving uh, dancing tango and playing blues guitar. Um, so let's get to uh, our business. Uh, everybody knows what is an API, right? Every, everybody kind of played with it a little bit, and maybe if you don't know what it is, uh, you there is a very big chance that you actually use it without knowing what what it is. An API is a set of uh, Instructions, components, and standards that somebody uh, lets you to use um, to use a library or a service. All right, uh, this in the in modern world uh, means that you can open up an application to the world. Um, let's say, for example, a very um, very good case of it, which is Twitter. Twitter has uh, a very widely used API. I mean, pretty much everybody uses it. Sign up with Twitter, that's their API, all right? So the first thing that you have to have in mind of an API is that allows integration. Integration right now in the modern world means that other people can use your software uh, at the point that you allow them to use, all right? And it means that if you're working, you can get more customers by allowing others to develop software that connects to your application uh, and provides more functionality. Functionality that maybe you're not willing to develop, but you are willing to offer through others, all right? So that's pretty much what an API is. 
uh, a real life case scenario. I can really give the name of the location due to NDAs and that kind of shit, sorry. Uh, but the case scenario it was a, a mobile game, actually, for iOS and Android, in which the users uh, needed to upload videos. And there was, uh, there was a series of APIs that uh, a team had developed in Ruby on Rails. Uh, they were working. They were working fine. It was a JSON API, you know, connecting uh, to mobile phones, uh, mobile uh, devices. And uh, this was deployed in Amazon Web Services, EC2, S3. It's kind of, you know, pretty standard. That's not really, it, it wasn't really a very, very complicated setup. Uh, there was a pool of HA proxies that routed requests through uh, four instances of Amazon Web Services. Um, and those running several Rails instances, each one, and those connected to Couchbase. Couchbase, Couchbase for those who don't know, it's uh, a key value database, a NoSQL database. Uh, it's real fast, real cool, really easy to scale. Uh, definitely worth to check it out. And uh, we used Scholar.com uh, to auto scale all of this stack, all right? Um, so the customer kind of had a need. Uh, he had a really tight budget. This was a self-funded startup. He didn't have any investor. He didn't have any money flowing in. So he had to actually put uh, money from his own pocket. So he was really constrained on how much he could spend on horsepower, all right? He came to us saying, hey, I need to cut cost and actually improve performance because uh, I keep spending more and more on servers and the uh, requests are still growing up and I will keep spending more and more on servers. So I don't have the money. Uh, I, I need to uh, do something about this, all right? Um, another requirement was uh, do scaling easy, okay? So provide me with a solution that uh, is not going to be hard to scale up, all right? Uh, we had to keep all the ribbon race functionality when it comes to the APIs, not the uh, um, administration interfaces. And as I already said, uh, it was a really tight budget. Inspiration, draw something. H have you ever, uh, one of you guys used draw something application? Just raise your hand. Cool, nice. Draw something uh, started up pretty much like we did. Um, they have a, a, a cool application, you know. A couple of celebrities, uh, celebrities uh, uh, tweeted that they love draw something, and everything started went crazy. They uh, started getting so many requests per seconds that they had to go back to the application and, and start refactoring code and add servers, and everything went out of scale. It was incredible. Um, we kind of know that case previously, so we kind of took inspiration for that. And that led us to um, Goliath. Goliath. Uh, what is Goliath, actually? It's uh, um, wh whoever heard about Goliath, played with it, worked with it, just raise your hands. I just want to know. Wow, very few. Nice. <laughs> this is contributing this an interesting talk. Cool. So Goliath is a non-blocking input-output server and web framework. Uh, it's kind of Node.js, all right, but in Ruby. You don't have to switch a language. You don't have to uh, switch to JavaScript to actually have input-output, uh, non-blocking server, all right? Um, we used also Beanstalk. Beanstalk uh, is a very fast, very efficient um, job queue. You can check it out. It's actually awesome. I really, uh, I really, didn't know it, but um, I get a recommendation from a friend. I started playing with it, and it's really good. Um, so check it out. We still have uh, been using Couchbase mainly because all the data, all the data was there, and it's a very good database. Uh, so uh, it's it was more than enough. Um, we put HA proxy as a load balancer, and 
uh, varnish for caching requests that actually were um, uh, able to be cached, all right? So, Goliath. Goliath works pretty much like the we will call you principle. It's like you, you go to a job interview and you say, hey, I did a good job, don't worry, we'll call you. Uh, it works pretty much like that. All right, so uh, it's based on the Evil Machine. Evil Machine is very popular in the Ruby uh, community. Uh, it was a project that has been uh, in, in, in the image for a long time. Uh, it's mature, it's, Goliath is really lightweight, and I mean, uh, when running in production mode, the server uh, only occupies 65K in memory. I mean, it's really lightweight. You can deploy many processes of Goliath and your server is not going to choke. That's, that's cool. It has a very nice rack API support. You can use all Rack's funcio functionality and you can use Rack's pl Rack plugins to improve what you want to do. Um, it has a very good configuration, uh, pretty much like, you know, uh, the standard uh, development mode, production mode, testing mode. You can add uh, as many uh, environments of, as you want. Um, it is fully asynchronous. And, and what I mean this is that you can, uh, for example, if you're using uh, web sockets or you're using, um, uh, you can upload a video asynchronously, it, it will work. Uh, it's there are plenty of examples in Goliath's um, uh, Git repository. You, I d you definitely should uh, check it out. Uh, later, we're going to. Uh, here's the, uh, the link. You can go there. Uh, it has no callbacks. We're going to take a look at it later, which is really cool. Much more clean code, uh, easier to maintain, easier uh, to develop. It's, it's, it's really good. And from top to bottom, from the moment that the request hits Goliath uh, to uh, bottom and back again until uh, Goliath answers, is only 0.3 milliseconds. It's really, really fast. I, I, I actually love this guy. Um, a little bit more about Beanstalk. Beanstalk is not that popular. Uh, you have, in the Ruby community, we have mm, a lot of, uh, you know, job processing queues. I mean, you have delay job, you have rescue, uh, you have sidekick. Sidekick is kind of the new kid in town. It's really good. You sell a lot. It's, it's really good. Beanstalk worked for us. Why? Because it consumes very low memory. Uh, rescue, for example, uses a lot of memory to store jobs. Beanstalk doesn't. Uh, Beanstalk just uses uh, the disk, hard drive. So, um, the most expensive component in any cloud server out there is memory, as, as you know, guys. You know, as much memory you want, it's more you have to pay. Um, so we needed something that consumed very low, uh, had a low, very low memory footprint, and Beanstalk does. Also, it's extremely easy to scale. You just uh, need another server with Beanstalk. You just add the IP address to the connection pool. There you are. Nothing else. It's, it's awesome. Um, you got several clients to choose from. Um, there's one I like that is called Backburner. Uh, really nice. Um, then you can, uh, what, what it actually works is that you just serialize your object and say, okay, Backburner, uh, here you are. Just take this job, do it, and you forget about pretty much anything else. Um, can work with parallel queues. I mean, you can have several queues, and this guy is going to uh, work with them uh, in parallel. It's not going to be sequentially working, uh, taking one job here, one job of the other, one job here. No, it's, it's parallel. It's, it's really good. Uh, definitely check it out. It's if, if you're uh, up to you know working with uh, job queues, it's, it's really good. So let's go back a little bit. Evan Machine. All right, uh, I kind of took it a little bit. It's really mature. Uh, it has been in the community for a long time. Um, the good thing is that you don't need to do three the network programming to have uh, multiple tasks at the same time running 
in your server, all right? It has a very active community. There are a lot of uh, plugins out there. And two examples in the, uh, in the Ruby community is Thin and Golaya. Thin, pretty much, may maybe you know them as a, as a uh, web server for Ruby. Uh, it is uh, used with Rails a lot. Um, so, reactor pattern. Who knows exactly what the reactor pattern is and how it works? Any, anybody did a, any, any research on that? No? Okay. Reactor pattern, sometimes it's a little bit mis misunderstood. So, uh, Douglas Smith was a guy working for Siemens at the time, and they had a little problem which does, uh, they had a, little of comp a lot of computers, a lot of services, uh, throwing messages uh, and, and, and log messages to uh, a queue that was, you know, doing everything a little bit slower. So they designed um, a pattern uh, to implement uh, with software uh, that could, you know, uh, keep listening while at the same time we're processing requests, all right? Um, the good thing about the reactor pattern is uh, it's single thread by definition. You don't have multi-threading there, which is uh, cool in, in the sense that uh, you don't have to deal with multi-threaded programming, which is really sometimes it can be really difficult and 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 actually uh, can provide a lot of confusion. All right, uh, it separates very well the logic from the reactor, the guy that says, "Okay, hey, I got a request. I, I got to throw it through a handler." from your application, all right? You don't worry about what this guy, what the reactor is doing, you just worry about your logic, your business logic. Um, the reactor pattern works pretty much like this. Uh, there is a, um, a reactor object that is uh, initialized, all right? And there are concrete handlers. Concrete handlers are the guys that you develop. All right, something that is going to do uh, something with, it, with the request and the data you are getting from the outside, all right? Um, then once the reactor pattern registers all of these handlers, okay, say, I know this is, uh, this is one handler, this is another handler, this is uh, uh, another handler, uh, it's just a start listening. It's a pretty much an endless loop. Listening, 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 listening. When it receives, and request from the outside, from the out, out world, um, selects, watch, uh, selects with uh, which actually handler it's going to use. It can be, for example, uh, a, a query to a database, printing something, uh, a query to another uh, service, whatever, and um, operates through the concrete handler, all right? This is the uh, most interesting thing about the reactor pattern. Why? Because he's going to be waiting. Uh, is he going to be waiting until the concrete handler finishes? No. He's going to keep listening. He's going to say, okay, handler, just do your job. And the handler is going to say, all right, I call you back when I'm done. All right? This can be a little bit uh, hard because why? In the programming uh, uh, word, this means callbacks, all right? So, every machine, you have a very simple example there. It's pretty much like that. You wrap your code in, a, in, in, in an every machine run uh, block, all right? It's just this is going to get um, data from example.com and I put the response, all right? So what's the problem? This is, doesn't seem really hard, actually. Uh, the problem is that when you want to do sequential stuff, I mean, first one step, then a second step, then a, se a third step, you can start having these kind of problems. You know, callback after callback after callback, and callback inside callbacks. That, it is not really good for uh, your code maintainability and, 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 and your code, um, the beautifulness <laughs> of your code, actually. Um, Goliath can solve this. Goliath uses seven machine, but it patches 
in the machine. It monkey patches, it doesn't use, use a thread, it uses fiber. So a difference, a difference between a thread and a fiber is actually that a fiber only yields the execution path when it's told so. I mean, an operat uh, the operating system, the scheduler on the operating system can take a thread and say, hey, this thread has been running for so long, just stop it. And that thread is going to be, you know, blown away and you won't have your response. A fiber, on the contrary, uh, will yield control to the caller only when the fiber uh, is told to do so in your code. So Goliath ways, in this case, you just do the request, you just get the second URL and do the HTTP. There's no callback there. Basically, each instruction is run inside of the fiber block. So no callbacks, it's much more beautiful, it's much more easy to maintain. You don't have to follow, you know, uh, a big spaghetti of callbacks. You just have your code. Uh, it's very, very, very important to use the appropriate libraries. Why? Task switching. When uh, Goliath says, okay, I need to do uh, a query to a database, all right? It just goes and simply query the database, gets the data, and returns that data. The problem is that if the driver that you're using is the adapter that you're using, it is not asynchronous. The problem is that this is going to block the operation. Instead of the uh, concrete handler say, okay, keep listening, I call you back. It's going to say, hey, wait, don't wait, don't, don't go, don't go, don't go, don't go. Just keep waiting. Keep waiting a little bit more, a little bit more, uh, and answer, all right? You need to use the correct drivers. If not, you're not getting the advantage all right, of Goliath task switching. It's not going to, uh, Goliath is not going to be able to uh, uh, switch task in the middle of, uh, of the query, all right? It's very, very important. In those two addresses, those two URLs, you can pretty much find any driver you want, any adapter you want. Uh, MySQL, Postgre, pretty much everything, all right? Routing. Goliath. There was a time when Goliath had um, routing built inside of it. Uh, you could actually say, okay, here's the path that I'm getting the URL. This should route to this action, to this controller, to this class, to whatever you uh, uh, build up there. Now, uh, routing was uh, uh, deleted from Goliath, it was taken off simple because uh, they actually didn't like it. I don't know, it's, it was cool to have routing there. Right now, you have to do it by hand. Uh, Ilya Grigorik, and I don't know if you know this guy, if you ever read his blog, just, uh, it is one of the, the guys to follow when you are into high performance uh, web services and web. He's, see, he's working for Google, and he's the top guy uh, when it comes to high-performance web. I mean, he's, he's awesome. Um, he's the one who created, actually, Goliath when, when in Postgres. Uh, it, it's, it's really, and, and his blog posts are really, really uh, awesome to read. So, Ilya kind of said, okay, let's take out routing, let's make each of Goliath servers that we're going to start up to serve only one endpoint of an API. Say that your API, that's serving hundreds of requests per second, uh, has 60 endpoints. You will have 60 Goliath servers up and running, each, own with, uh, each of those with its own code. That's really cumbersome. That's, in, in, in my view, it's, it's really prone to errors. I understand the concept. Uh, Ilya says that um, Goliath is meant to be as close to the metal as possible. That's cool. That's, uh, that's actually what uh, it gives uh, such a good performance, 
all right? But uh, we kind of went a little bit crazy about this because we had 60, uh, if I not recall, uh, uh, if I'm not wrong, it was 65 APIs endpoints. Uh, we were not going to start 65 Goliath processes. So we kind of tried to fix this routing and it was actually really easy to do. We got um, a little bit inspired by Rails, a little bit inspired by Rails, and we started using convention over configuration. So we don't actually have um, a routing file. How it works, um, if the URL is a server API game create game, all right, it was when uh, we got the URL, we redirected it straight to API game create game RB, and we had the class that we extended uh, that uh, from API controller, which is a controller that we built. We're planning to release a gem with this, all right? Uh, it's still a work in progress as a gem, uh, so I'll wait for it a little bit more, but it's going to be ready, and it's, it's, it's going to be really uh, very easy to um, um, create endpoints and make them available in your application. And this is actually the good thing about Goliath. Goliath allows very easy scaling. It's just some web server waiting, all right? You can have as many as you want. Even, for example, if you have one, ser one Goliath process running, uh, you can start up three, four, five, six on the same computer, and um, you will have pre pretty much no memory consumption. The processor is going to be uh, working um, pretty much at its full capacity, but it's going to be very well, um, very well used. S Goliath. At servers, add processes, configure them in HA proxy. you're done. Uh, there's nothing more complicated than that. Uh, it's very simple. It's very, very simple. Uh, then Couchbase. Couchbase is the other, you know, bottleneck we got here. Uh, as you know, databases can be uh, the guys responsible for uh, slow responses. So uh, what's cool about Couchbase is, is that you just add another server to the cluster and he's going uh, to uh, distribute the load between the clusters. And there's uh, a very cool um, functionality that the, it doesn't have um, a single point of failure. I mean, uh, it distributes the work so well that is, uh, there is pretty much no way that if the connection was made to one of the, uh, the servers in the cluster, uh, this is going to fail. It's, it's really cool. Check, really check it out. And we use a scholar to automate this, uh, uh, the scaling of these two. It was really easy to do. It was really fast to do. We kind of took this project, Rails, APIs, having problems, slow answers, slow responses to the clients, and we converted it to Goliath doing a major refactoring of the code, major refactoring. Why major refactoring? Because these guys weren't actually Rails guys. They were Java guys that built up an, an API in, in Ruby, uh, in Ruby on Rails. So it was, the code was awful. <laughs> Let me tell you this. Uh, many, many requests to the database, many requests to the database, completely, completely useless. And what we did was uh, take the models, pretty much put the logic in the models, leave the controllers for basically only interaction uh, uh, with the router, and created a kind of uh, object classes, uh, uh, Ruby objects to handle some work there. So what we did is actually require those models from Goliath. We didn't have to do any other work than that. If you design your application correctly and you, uh, your controllers are really skinny, you can pretty much say, hey, Goliath, take these models, take these objects, and work with them. You won't have to do pretty much anything else. 
it's really fast as uh, in development times too, all right? So it's, it's a very, very nice project. Active Record has uh, an adapter. Um, in, the, uh, in the workshop I um, did on uh, last Thursday, we played it with it a little bit. Some of the guys are here. And they said that we had a race application models. Hey, go ahead, take those models, work with them. Nothing else. Nothing else. Uh, it's really, really simple to do. So, results. Went from 450 requirements per second on the original application to 1,300 requirements per second. While reducing the amounts of servers, we went from four um, Amazon instant servers to only one. I mean, Goliath can take that much pounding. Only one can replace four servers. Only one Goliath can replace four servers. Uh, last Thursday, uh, we kind of tried to choke Goliath, still responding perfectly well. And pretty much we tripled the performance. Uh, I mean, this guy was working uh, perfectly well. It, it wasn't choking at all, actually, with all the requests per seconds that we had gained. We tested, we tested it with AB, HTTPerf, JMeter, I love JMeter. If you don't know him, just uh, look for it. It's a very cool testing uh, environment for uh, web applications. You can pretty much simulate uh, the user's interaction and, and, and uh, request ramp up. Uh, it's, it's really cool. Uh, check it out. And the video load and processing went from, oh, I did forget to put that, uh, went from uh, 40 jobs per second, because they were using delay job, all right? Delay job is actually really cool to start with, but when you start having uh, lots of uh, jobs to process, it kind of, you know, check out. That's why rescue comes in and, and then sidekick. Uh, it started processing at 200, uh, 250 jobs per second with a very low memory consumption, uh, very, uh, because as I told you, Beanstack works, can work in parallel. We had the notifications too, uh, using the Apple Notification Network and Android's Notification Network. We had them uh, on um, Beanstalk too. So the good thing about this is that he re was really able to save money. And I mean, save money for the sport stuff, save, save money for development hours, you know, guys coding pay the guys that are coding. That's good for you too, guys. I mean, uh, if you can keep your jobs, it's, 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 it's really nice. Um, so the good thing about this is that you can use Goliath in your regular race application. Just select those APIs that you think that are really critical. Another example is a website. All right, a regular website that you uh, use Ajax. You use a lot of Ajax calls. Uh, you may have long polling, whatever. Uh, you can build this website and switch all the Ajax calls to APIs provided by Goliath. It's really going to, uh, it's going to start helping you a lot. Why? Because Goliath can take a lot more pounding than Rails, a lot more, and Rails is going to be um, more free <laughs> to uh, keep listening to other requests that might have to do with, for example, uh, registration, login, sign up, uh, uh, you know, serving web pages, whatever. You have to select those APIs that are critical to your business to all your customers' business. Um, so have it in mind that uh, this guy, this bad guy is out there. You can use it. It's not very well known. The community is very good, actually. Uh, I posted a couple of questions in Goliath uh, um, Google Groups, and actually Ilya Grigory responded himself in a couple of hours. Uh, you won't have any issue. The community is very, is very helpful. 
Uh, there are a lot of drivers that you can use. Uh, even there's a driver that's called, uh, it's a library that's called AM Synchrony, where y there's a s it is a set of helpers that you can use to build your own asynchronous drivers very easily. Um, so definitely check it out. And pretty much we're done. Uh, any questions, comments you might have, whatever. Sir, please repeat the question. Uh, he's asking me um, if at any point in time I found out something that it was actually really hard to do with Goliath. Is that right? Perfect. Um, no, I didn't encounter that situation. I'm not saying that it doesn't exist, but I didn't found myself in, in that position. Um, the good thing about Goliath is that it's so close to the metal and it provides so much integration with Ruby and, and different libraries and different adapters and, and connectors that you can do pretty much whatever you want, all right? But you, as, as I told you guys, you have to be very careful when selecting which drivers are you using. If you use, for example, uh, a connection pool of uh, 30 uh, connections to a MySQL database using the MySQL adapter, you're going to be in trouble because it's going to be blocking uh, Goliath, the tax switch, and you have to do use the EM MySQL adapter. EM stands for Event Machine. So that's the key. Use the right driver. If not, you're going to be wasting what Goliath can do for you. All right? It's, it's very important that you uh, uh, select the appropriate driver. Any other question, comment, whatever? Lady? Sessions, Sessions management. All right. In this project, actually, we didn't handle sessions. Uh, we did handle a secure, a security was handled with uh, tokens. We provided a, a token um, um, server that the client was getting, all right? And with that token that was valid only for one use, uh, we identified what was happening in the uh, backend server. Token management uh, sometimes can be a little bit complicated, a little bit confusing, but once you understand it and uh, can provide a, little, a lot of functionality for your application without having to have sessions. Sessions are like a pretty much, uh, it's like a little monster. Uh, it, web development wasn't made to use sessions. Sessions are a patch. Uh, so we try not to use it, we try to leave uh, uh, the APIs as stateless as possible, only using tokens. That's, that was pretty much the solution. It works really well. Uh, all right, so I think we're pretty much done. And uh, thank you very much. It was really a pleasure for me to be here. <laughs> thank you.